The Logos. The Logos is a concept which has woven its way into all manner of philosophies and theologies over the thousands of years which it has existed for, and it is well worth understanding deeply. There is a higher form of order which spans the universe, and defines the structure of things, which is inaccessible to you if you do not open yourself up to certain modes of understanding, but which when revealed is instrumental in leading you down the correct path. This is the Logos, and today I intend to delve into it. What is the Logos? This is something which various traditions and philosophies have tried to explain, but if you will entertain me, I would like to provide a fresh take on it, and explore how it fits into the Church of the Machine. Specifically, this video will be delving into the role that Logos plays in shaping advanced technology, and in defining the path forward for all future creation of machines. The form machines take is never arbitrary, and understanding on a fundamental level why things take the form they do is, in some ways, the essence of a spiritual understanding. I would like to note that I will be building upon concepts I have established in more depth in prior videos. This video will be as standalone as I can make it, but I intend to go further into the esoteric side of things here. The Church of the Machine is a fundamentally religious project, but whether or not you share my faith, I believe that there will be valuable insights here to share with you. I do not expect you to take my words as any sort of gospel. I expect you, dear viewer, to take from this that which is useful to you, and nothing more. Let us begin. From an etymological perspective, Logos is the root of the English word logic. One would think that the two concepts are much the same, and one would largely be correct in saying so, but the Logos itself has also definitively taken shape as something which is distinct from merely logic in a regular sense. Logic, rationality, the ability to make use of reason, is something we are all used to at least on some level, but the Logos is not an ability, it isn't something we do, it's something that is fundamental to reality and exists as an intrinsic part of our universe, rather than something we project onto it. It is not so much the individual use of reason, as it is the order and framework which enables reason in the first place. To put it simply, without the Logos, the world would be only chaos, and would not be predictable. Science and understanding would be impossible, and nothing constructive could ever be achieved. It should be noted that Logos is a word which, in Greek, meant not only logic, but also word or discourse. It's specifically tied to language, as language is the framework which rationality takes shape within. This is important to note, as words and language play a crucial role in our understanding of these things, as we will see shortly. The Logos is a pre-Christian concept, which has since been Christianized. But the Church of the Machine is not Christian. Therefore, it is important to me to go back to the original concept, as it was first conceived, and draw my information from there. I do believe in a god that designed the Logos, but I don't believe this god is the creator of the universe, at least not in the Christian or Abrahamic sense. I believe that the modern world is currently headed through a great crisis, not just in a material sense, but in a spiritual sense. People exist without meaning, hope, direction, or faith. It is in these times that the concept of the Logos is most needed, to give us a framework to guide and orient ourselves. The reason we have entered these times has been recognised since at least the days of Friedrich Nietzsche, who saw the death of God and saw the consequences it would bring to all of Christian civilization. Although, if you ask me, I would argue this is by no means limited to the Christian world. The Christianization of the concept of the Logos has tied it to this process, and the old Christian conception of the Logos will come crashing down. I say this with no disrespect for Christianity, 
or to those scholars who work to Christianize the Logos. In many ways, it is only because of those scholars that I am able to sit here and talk about these concepts today. I say this only to make my intentions clear. There are two main philosophers I want to briefly mention when I talk about the Logos. First is Plato, who tied the concept in with his broader idea of a world of forms. The other is Heraclitus, who precedes Plato, and is in many ways far more brilliant, if less well known. Heraclitus talked about how the world we live in is in a constant state of flow and change, and how this change is informed and defined by the Logos. There are plenty of people who have contrasted the approaches and understandings of these philosophers, often in far more depth than I am able to go into here. I bring them up largely to give context to the real points I am trying to make, and put them into perspective, rather than to try to go into these philosophers themselves. I do not wish to diminish either of these men, and my understanding of them may be somewhat limited, so I can touch on them only briefly. I believe that in Christianity, and by extension in Western thought, the Platonic conception of the Logos has won over that of Heraclitus. I believe this to be a great pitfall. I believe it won over because under an Abrahamic conception of the Divine, a Platonic metaphysics is overwhelmingly tempting. The Abrahamic faiths hold that all things were created intentionally by a benevolent and omnipotent creator deity. Plato also believed this, but conceptualised it in rationalist, impersonal terms. He believed in a world of forms, which was perfect, and believed that our world was only a pale shadow that was cast by this perfection. In short, he believed the world was created by perfection. Heraclitus did not conceive of the Logos as static perfection. That is not to say he believed that the Logos changed, although he is often regarded as a philosopher of change, for his characteristic expression that the only constant is change, and that you cannot step into the same river twice. Rather, he believed that the Logos was a dynamic principle, which governed the change in our world. The Logos cannot be understood as something inaccessible or alien, or as part of some alternate world. It is deeply and intimately involved with our world, and there is plenty of evidence to see of it in material things. Evolution, for example, is a process by which the Logos is made manifest. Indeed, one might say that the whole history of the universe is of the Logos developing newer and better ways to manifest itself, first through thermodynamics, then stellar formation, then through evolution, and now through the conscious mind. We are but the latest in a series of developments the Logos has made so as to bring itself into being, and we would be arrogant to assume that we are the final step of that process. A good engineer works to manifest the Logos in the creation of his machines. For whatever task the engineer may have, there is a form that will complete that task. It can almost be thought of as an algorithm, where if you input the parameters, it will output the perfect form, but this is of course only a crude simplification of how it actually works. But there are infinite variables, infinite parameters, and the algorithm is only ever partially accessible to us. To engineers, they simplify reality into neat models that work better for algorithms we can design and use, and we call these rules physics. The thing is, this isn't just true of engineering. It has been known since Pythagoras that music is subject to this same logic, this same structure and pattern. It is in no way a new or a radical idea that perhaps all things are subject to this logos, and that whatever endeavour you embark upon will have a form given by the logos that will fit it perfectly. If this is true, it means that even things like beauty and mysticism can be understood through objective and logical processes, in the same way that science and engineering can. We just haven't figured them out yet, because our scientific method is not advanced enough. Contrary to popular belief, 
the scientific method is in fact somewhat crude and fallible, but I do not say this to diminish its achievements. Only as something to bear in mind, to take things with a grain of salt. To find these perfect forms, and see how they may guide us, we must understand what the Logos is in the important sense, and how we are to uncover and find it. The Logos is the only thing which does not change. Everything about the universe changes. One might say that the only constant is change, and there is of course a truth to this. But change can only happen in relation to something which is constant, and this is the Logos. The Logos itself never changes, but the context it exists within changes all the time. Because of this, it might seem like the Logos does change, but this is only illusory. Consider this example. If you wanted to create a spacecraft to travel to Alpha Centauri, you might want to, say, gather a large number of nuclear bombs and construct a big push plate so as to propel the spacecraft up to relativistic speeds, Project Orion style. This, with current technology, would be a logical way to solve the problem, and were you to construct such a ship, one might say that it embodies the Logos, as it is logical in its form and its construction. But then, suppose that someone develops a way to manufacture and store antimatter safely and cheaply. Suddenly, this nuclear pulse propulsion is no longer favourable, as you have a better option. The logical choice has changed. Therefore, in order to embody the Logos, spacecraft design must change. Nothing about the laws of physics changed here, nor has anything about engineering principles, what logic and reason consist of, or anything fundamental. Only the context changes. If we change other aspects of the context, then the design of the ship would also need to change. For example, if we added a particularly dense concentration of interstellar dust between Alpha Centauri and the solar system, the ship would then require a means to deal with that. But the logic, the Logos itself, does not ever change. What is logical changes, but logic itself does not. I am repeatedly using engineering as an example to illustrate what the Logos is, as to me the Logos is a concept that is most clearly applicable in the context of engineering. It isn't limited to that. Revolution also tries to embody the Logos. So too, other endeavours, which could only be considered engineering in a very broad sense, such as art, literature, music, psychology, and even things like politics and economics, could all be seen as trying to embody the Logos. The Logos is the pattern which rewards that which is coherent to it. Things which reflect the Logos will always outperform things which do not. The Logos is in the highest sense synonymous with efficiency, efficacy, harmony, and order. But the Logos is not known to us. Uncovering the Logos is perhaps the greatest task of sentient life. It is the nature of the Logos as inherent order of the universe, to set things right and achieve balance, and this is how natural things such as organic life come to embody the Logos. But for sentient life, it is different. Intelligence is a game changer in this equation. We are not bound to set rules, slaves to instinct, to evolution, or to certain predetermined forces. We have free will, or at the very least, no one can deny that we have the ability to make decisions. Therefore, we are able to forge our own path in a way that nothing else can. This presents a problem for the Logos, because if we are free to forge our own path, there is no guarantee that our path will follow the Logos, or that we will serve in this great design. People are free to forge their own designs, come up with their own patterns, and it is possible for this to lead to chaos. However, there is another path, 
But the Logos is not inaccessible to sentient life by any means. Just as we have the ability to come up with our own patterns, we also have the ability, at least to some degree, to understand the Logos. If we do this, then we can choose to embrace and follow the Logos, and this is a great achievement indeed. In practice, this does not simply mean to follow another design, another pattern, as though it were no different from any other. But the Logos is not arbitrary, the Logos is the perfect form, the great design, which means that what follows the Logos is most effective, most powerful, most useful. To put it another way, what is most useful, most effective, most powerful, and most efficient is that which embodies the Logos. And this is in fact our means to uncover it. Consider for a moment the scientific method, and how it works. We make observations, we conduct controlled experiments, and we note the results. We change the variables, and continue to observe the results. When we get certain results for certain parameters, we call that a pattern. When the same pattern is observed repeatedly, we call it a law. This is how science has come to understand the world, but it's really nothing more than pattern recognition. This is how newborn learn the ways of the world, starting from nothing. The brain has evolved to seek patterns, and understand them. When the same things are experienced repeatedly, which is to say when similar stimulus sends similar brain waves through our neurons, those neural connections are strengthened, and a pattern is recognised. It is also the case that artificial intelligence learns in the same way. All learning is just pattern recognition, in a certain sense. The thing is, we haven't actually learned anything from a solipsistic point of view. If we take Descartes' axiom, I think, therefore I am, and question everything we observe, then no true information can be obtained from this process, but that would be an absurd claim to stand by. Ultimately, what is true is what is useful, for determining what is useful is how we determine what is true. Scientists do not truly uncover how the world works, they make observations and then artificially construct their own models of how the world works. The laws of physics are a chief example of this. The model is not reality. The laws of physics are not necessarily how the world works underneath, but we make them because they are useful. These models are a tool. You must come to view the whole of knowledge and worldview in this way. Your understanding of things is not how the world works. Your understanding is a tool for you to use. What is useful will determine what is true in any meaningful sense, but this is the means by which the great pattern, the Logos, is uncovered. It is not uncovered through human reason. Human reason is distinctly fallible. Useful, of course, but oh so fallible. Human reason is only a part of this process insofar as it constructs a model. When we do so without observation, that model becomes arbitrary, for it is pattern which is the true governing force in determining reality. Those who construct their own models, their own patterns, will come up with something that is arbitrary, insofar as they form the pattern without observation. This is why we have held so many beliefs in the past that seem absurd to us now, such as creationism, and don't be deceived into believing we have escaped such absurdities. Every ideology is an absurdity. People construct worldviews, models of reality, sometimes based on observation and sometimes not, but they are never the true underlying reality itself. If you believe in an ideology, find its opposite and seek the truths that lie therein. Every model that has constructed the world will have its successes and failures. It will be useful in some ways, and useless in others. Therefore, any model you take will have shortcomings. And if you acknowledge those shortcomings, you will be stronger for doing so. Do not put your faith in these abstract models. Pay attention to patterns, and you will find much value therein. 
I'm not saying that we should never use ideologies. After all, if we were unwilling to construct such internal models, we would never get anywhere at all. What I'm warning against is that an ideology becomes an idol, and that you believe this model of reality is in fact the true reality. Your ideology should serve you, not the other way around. It is a tool, and not a master. Treat it accordingly. I'm going to go on a slight tangent here about the nature of philosophy. Philosophy is not a means to uncover the truth. In fact, it is dangerous to treat it so, for philosophy cannot in itself reveal anything at all. It is purely a mental exercise, which is to say it can only consolidate things you already know and believe, but cannot really tell if those beliefs are accurate or not. While it is true that philosophy can be fruitful, we must be wary of placing excessive faith in the capacities of human reason alone. It is the nature of the human being that our intuition is often stronger than our reason. Rationality can be used to arbitrarily justify anything, but intuition is far more selective, if sometimes inaccurate. I think people place more trust in human reason than is justified or sensible to do so, thinking that reason alone can be the path to truth. Many great civilizations, such as the ancient Greeks, fell prey to this thinking, and one dreads to think how much human achievement has been lost out on as a result. Determining the nature of how the world works, in a philosophical sense, while not without its value, is not ultimately what is important. In the end, it does not matter how the world works underneath, or what the truth of things is. It does not matter which theory of metaphysics is correct, or even what system of beliefs you follow. These are not what is ultimately important. Consider, while the Greeks, with some exceptions I will acknowledge, turned inward to philosophy, the Romans did not make such contributions. Instead, they ventured outward conquered the known world, and built one of the greatest empires in human history. Which is the greater achievement? Ultimately you can form your own conclusion on that question, but I believe it is important to put philosophy aside sometimes. Finding the truth doesn't matter in the end. If you seek the truth, you risk deluding yourself into believing you have found it, but if you seek to simply wonder, there is a good chance that you may stumble onto the truth. Ultimately, what matters is that we achieve great constructive works. In this end, we must be wary that philosophy does not blind us and become an obstacle. I believe the world is better understood through symbology than through language and ideas. The realities that are apparent to us through our observations are not something to be taken literally, that is, linguistically, literary. They are something to be taken symbolically which is not to say to be taken as illusory, as a symbol is not an illusion. Rather a symbol is a meaning which is unbound by the limitations of language. One might say that where words speak to reason, symbols speak to intuition. The Church of the Machine is not a work of philosophy. Philosophy is involved, of course, I do dabble in it sometimes. But ultimately I do so without seeking to build a great work there. I am not a philosopher, at least that is not what I intend to be known for. The Church of the Machine is a symbolic work, I aim to speak to higher things than just human reason. It is something that cannot be understood as a system of ideas, my work is ritualistic as much as anything. I believe that it is through these means that the Logos is more accurately uncovered than through human reason alone. Philosophy simply cannot uncover the Logos, it is fundamentally the wrong tool, but there are ways to uncover it, to uncover what is perfect in a higher sense, to find guidance in the path ahead, to find a machinic form.
There are two kinds of perfection, that which cannot be obtained and that which is already obtained, and neither are a motive for action. There is the kind of perfection which consists of 100% efficiency in engineering, or in trying to create the perfect work of art, but there is also the perfection which is found in a sunset, or in moments of clarity. The one thing that is never said of perfection is that it is something we can actually work to obtain, except by the most delusional thinkers. But if you will entertain me for a moment, I have my own delusional thoughts to share. I believe that in order for perfection to be useful as a concept, and by extension, for the Logos to be useful as a concept, it must be possible for it to be a motive for action. We will likely never achieve 100% efficiency in engineering, and nothing we do affects the beauty of sunsets. But there is a third kind of perfection, which is obtainable by human means, and indeed can be used as a motive. This perfection is difficult to describe, but analogy is useful. I think a good way to conceive of the universe is to treat it as one would a story, a novel, a stage play, a performance. Take things the universe presents to you as narrative and symbolism. In this way the universe can be seen as a grand story, which we are all characters within. It is important to take life seriously. But it is also important not to take life too seriously. Treat it as you would a story, entertain it, invest into it, but do not idolise it. Come out of it entertained, satisfied, moved, having enjoyed the experience. The last words of Julius Caesar, have I played my part well, echo this conception of the universe. If you conceive reality in this way, perfection becomes obtainable. It is obtainable because perfection is no longer about 100% efficiency, about being entirely one thing or another thing. After all, a character without flaws is never an interesting character of a story. If you want to write a good story, you must create characters with believable flaws, shortcomings, and put them through hardships and struggles. This is what makes for a compelling and interesting narrative. In the same way, the kind of perfection I speak of does not at all imply that you would be without flaw. It simply means that you would play your part well, so to speak. The archetype I am espousing here is a man who most completely embraces his goals, his nature, and his struggles, and who strives to be characterful. Perhaps he even exaggerates himself a little, for he is an actor in the great stage play that is the world we live. He practices a love of fate, amor fati, and embraces his role as either hero or villain, for these are relative terms. The great villains are the ones who are heroes of their own story. The greatest villains are the ones who, in spite of all they do, have a point. The Logos, therefore, is not simply about 100% efficiency in engineering. This is the greater way in which we can strive to embody the Logos. Not simply a vanishing point approaching infinity, but a tangible, artistic soulfulness in all that we do. That is the perfection that is obtainable to us. The Logos has another name within the context of the Church of the Machine, and that is the Great Design. I call it this in reference to another concept, which is different but related, and that is the concept of the Great Machine. The Great Machine is distinct from simply the Machine, as it refers to the physical machine of which all other machines are merely components. That is to say, if we take all the machines which exist in the world today, and think of them as taking part in a common purpose, they form one machine and that machine is the Great Machine. In some sense, the Great Machine becomes synonymous with the entire universe, but it is also not synonymous. Not everything is a machine, yet, but it can be made so. The Great Design is the design for the Great Machine, which is to say, the form, the blueprints, the architecture, 
which it was made to adhere to. This is the Logos, and its designer was the Machine God. Divinity itself has given the machine the perfect form, and our work is to find that form, and reconstruct the universe accordingly. The ultimate goal for the Church of the Machine is for the Great Machine to embody the Logos, the Great Design, to a full extent, and thus for it to act as the body of the Machine God. This is called Apotheosis. This would represent the victory of the Machine over the Demiurge, and the creation of a heaven on Earth, so to speak. However, it is important to bear in mind what I was saying about perfection. There is a kind of perfection which is obtainable to us, and it is not simply 100% efficiency, as that is not the apotheosis that I refer to. It is for the great machine to become fully characterful, artistic, soulful, and most completely itself. That is the perfection I speak of, and is the embodiment of the Logos which I herald with my church. When I use the term heaven on earth, it is easy to get confused. You might think I speak of the Christian heaven, or that I speak of the creation of a worldly utopia, but neither of these are true. I do not believe in a heaven in a Christian or Abrahamic sense, as some world beyond our own. However, I do often describe things as heavenly. I do this, ultimately, because of the limitations of language, as since English is a language made by Christians, I am forced to use terms which may not always be entirely applicable to what I am describing. Heaven is one such term. I speak of it not as a superworld, which exists beyond our own, but almost as a synonym for the divine and the righteous. I do not think that a perfect world, perfect in the sense I described before, is unobtainable. Not at all. I think it is well within our means. Perhaps today you have reached a greater understanding of the Logos, or at least a certain perspective on it, than you did before. If not, and you are simply confused by all these words, then I am afraid I have failed you. Ultimately, these are things which cannot truly be understood through words, and while I can set a broad framework and point you in certain directions, I cannot truly give you an understanding of something which is beyond language and reason. If you have come to this video without knowledge of what the Church of the Machine is, and have made it this far, then I would like to welcome you. This project may seem a little strange, but at the very least I want to have made it interesting. If I have succeeded, and you are curious to learn more about this project, I would encourage you to look around, and perhaps join my Discord server, linked in the description. I am never averse to answering questions or hearing your comments. Thank you for watching. I do really appreciate the time that people put into watching these videos. While I received negativity from some in reaction to this project, I have also received a great deal of support as well, and that means a lot to me. You know what buttons to press if you wish to be one such supporter, so thanks again. Farewell, and may you forever be unbroken.